Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Time of the Writer. And this session is titled Beyond Words, Race, Gender, and Power. So I'll start introducing our writer, Sunyati, is an investment analyst by profession and a writer by passion. Sue is the editor of When Secrets Become Stories, Women Speak Out, an anthology of nonfiction narratives of female encounters with gender-based violence through the life cycle of womanhood. Nyati is also the author of three best-selling fiction novels, The Polygamist, The Gold Digger, and A Family Affair. Uh, our writer, Florence uh, progovsky Shekete is a school principal in Meningham and a German best-selling author. She founded the agency FBS Intercultural Communication, where she has worked as a freelance consultant, coach, and a trainer since 1997. She has worked as a teacher, principal, and school consultant, and has written the book, Damn, She Understands Me, um, which, which encounters her story. And then our other writer is a Ukrainian award-winning writer, Victoria Amelina, is a laureate of the Ukrainian National Literary Award, uh, Korinistia Slova. Her credits include being shortlisted for the Lit Akasek Book of the Year, Viv City of UNESCO Literary Award, European Union Prize um, of, for Literature. And then, not least, um, um, Professor Nompumelelo Zondi is, an is a professor and a head of department um, of African languages at the University of Pretoria. To challenge the hegemony of Eurocentric um, theories in addressing African problems, she's currently exploring techniques, shifting away from such approaches by researching approaches to address African issues using Afrocentric paradigms. Her book, Bahlabelelani, Why Do They Sing? is a fresh, intimate, critical portrait of women's songs in contemporary rural KwaZulu Natal. Okay, my first question for our writers is, what does it mean for you as a woman who comes from the countries that you come from? Um, to partake in the practice of writing in the 21st century. Sue Nati, uh, I mean, Sue Nyati, can you please start us off with your answer? Hi, Ongezwa. Thank you so much for the glowing introduction and having me on this platform. You know, I don't take it lightly to be on this platform and to be a, write, a female writer, you know, in Africa. I mean, I think if you think back when we first had the first uh, woman published, it was in the 30s, Florence Nwapa. Mm. And then I look at my own country, Zimbabwe. I remember, I think Barbara Makalisa was the first woman to have her books published in the 70s. And she was writing Inisin Debele or what you call Isizu. And then later it was Titi Dangaremba who became the first woman to be published in English a female author, and that was in 1988. And then came women like Yvonne Vera after her. So you can imagine that, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of women writing, female writers, we didn't have representation in terms of, you know, seeing, you know, women, a lot of women writing. So for me, I, I love what has now happened that, you know, a lot of women are now dominating the writing scene in my country in Zimbabwe. I mean, if you look at No Violet Bulawayo, it's pure mm. glory and there are so many female writers now um, and we're taking up that space so for me you know that's that's very important that's why you know i'm i'm glad to be counted you know amongst the female writers in my country so it really does mean a lot to me thank you thank you sue and thank you for bringing the names um in into this um platform 
because the work is ongoing. Florence, please take it on with the question, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. It's really an honor. So I'm really happy to be here. Well, um, for me, it um, the book I published 2020 was the first one. The second one is now coming, but it was the first one. And for me, I never um, imagined that I could uh, could write a book. And I wrote my I wrote my biography, author biography. And first of all, I thought, well, who who will be interested in reading this? Um, I'm um, a child to Nigerian parents, but I was raised by a German um, mom. So my mom is, is German, is white. And I, it was said, or it is said that I'm the first German black teacher here and then um, school principal and now um, school inspector. And uh, to write my autobiography in German and to have the German audience and to tell them how it is to live as a black person here in Germany, in this environment, in the white environment. That's something very special. And I couldn't imagine that this book uh, will become a best-selling book, but it is. And um, well, for me, it is uh, still really amazing. And um, I love writing. But as I said, I couldn't imagine before that this book could be that successful and that people even want to know something about my biography, about my personal biography. Thank you so much, Florence. Uh... The power of imagination, right? Right. Once you imagine it, it can happen. Um, Victoria, please let us know what it means for you to write as a woman. Yeah, thank you. So actually in uh, Ukrainian literature, women's voices were always uh, very important. And um, uh, one of our three uh, main iconic writers is a woman, Lesya Ukrainka. Mm. is her name and she's one of the most famous so there's not much of a problem with that right now but um during the 20th century uh entire ukrainian literature was endangered and so was uh, the women who uh wrote in ukrainian for instance mm -hmm. in 1930s in uh, the soviet union with the stalin's regime um, more than 85% of uh, Ukrainian writers, playwrights uh, were purged, were just shot, executed. Uh, and this of course includes women as well. Um, so, and um, right now we also had some, we, we call it executed Renaissance, what happened in 1930s in Ukraine, because we had some kind of Renaissance and then it all vanished. During the last 30 years, we had a renaissance as well. And a huge part of that renaissance were women writers, of course. Uh, and But right now what's happening uh, is we're being executed again. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, yesterday, a young journalist, unfortunately, I don't remember her name because there are too many victims now, but a young journalist, and I remember she was 24 years old and she was killed in the streets of Kyiv, our capital, mm. by, by Russian bomb or something. Uh, so this is what, what's happening now. And right now I am not writing, but uh, helping refugees, sorting out humanitarian aid. So right now we see again that women's voices were not enough to to stop the, the violence and to prevent uh, the Russian invasion. So this is how, how I feel about women's writing now or any writing. Mm. What comes, what comes um, out from um, what you say is the risk of speaking out, right? That it's yeah. just never enough. Um, and that we're still in a crisis, a crisis of war. I guess, um, in Ukraine. Thank you for, for that input. Uh, Prof. Wam, Prof. Mpume, what does it mean for you as a woman coming from the country that you come from to, to write? Okay, first of all, uh, may I think uh, the time of the writer organizers for um, inviting me to share the platform with these uh, 
amazing international women um, coming from uh, South Africa um, and uh, KwaZulu Natal, um, a province of my birth, even though right now I'm in Pretoria where I'm working. So um, it just feels good to be half home and half elsewhere, but within my province. And so, you know, I am much more into um, scholarly writing, you know, scholarly publishing, um, articles, journals, that kind of thing. However, you know, being a, a, a South African, African and Zulu woman, for me, means a lot. Uh, at this time of our history. You know, I would wish to write on a wide range of uh, themes, um, you know, in my work. However, I've just been such that I love the voiceless. I love the marginalized. I love those whom society uh, pushes to the margins. So as such, how, you know, whenever I approach my uh, scholarly uh, work, it is just a spontaneous thing for me that I'm not going to write about the privileged. I'm not going to write about people who have it all. And uh, I guess this might have a lot to do with uh, my background. So that is what influences the way I think. That is what uh, shapes my thoughts where, you know, coming from a rural village, being born and bred in a rural village, you know, and knowing what uh, to be in need means, and uh, yet appreciating the fact that my own parents could provide for us. And while around us, there were people who didn't have much. So for me, this period, you know, I always feel like uh, it's, uh, we are almost into a quarter of a, a, a 21st century. And I really don't think we should be talking about these things now, marginalization, oppression, mm -hmm. gender-based violence, all these kind of things. However, these are real issues that affect real people. So my interest is really more on issues, issues of the uh, marginalized, such as women. Thank you. Uh, the feminists say that the personal is political. So you've just highlighted that very well. Um, what I also, you remind me of is Bell Hooks, the late Bell Hooks, Professor Bell Hooks, and a feminist from the US who says, um, work, there's resistance in the margins. There's work that is being done in the margins. Um, Florence, I will actually ask you this question. I'll start with you. How uh, does your writing process look like, right? Um, well, when I started 2018, it was just like, um, well, or let me even go, go um, back to, to the beginning of the 20s. Um, I, how I said, I was born here and I have a son. He is, um, his father is white and um, yeah, so he's mixed. And we really um, approach a lot of, of situations because of our, uh, of how we look like, yeah, because of, we are black, uh, black living in, in the white community. And sometimes I always say, well, this is really uh, quite funny and I should write a book. And when people ask me, where, where are you from? Then here, it doesn't mean, um, oh, you just took the bus and where, where do you come from? But it's, where are you from? So where's your origin from, right? And when I then tell them where I'm from, that my parents are Nigerians and so on, and I was born here and so on, um, then they say, after listening, they say, well, you should write a book because it's that interesting. And then um, I said to my son, well, you know, you have to, to um, buy a little notebook 
sure, I, I paid it, but he should, um, you know, look for something nice. And I said, well, I will try and, and start writing my story. And if I'm going to publish it or not, I don't know, but I'm just going to write it out. And then I did. And um, while writing, so you asked about the writing process, you know, my story is with me everywhere. So I had this little notebook and I sat everywhere and I wrote um, either in a cafe or in the on the train or wherever. And then when I nearly finished, I said, well, perhaps it's a good idea to publish it. And then I looked for a good publisher and it took me a while, but then there were four. And then I um, uh, decided to take the, the most loveliest publisher I could ever meet in, in Berlin, the Orlanda Verlag. And um, I spoke to the publisher and she said, uh, she wrote, she read my, my script and then she said, oh yeah, I would like to do that. Yeah. And that's how everything started. And then I realized, oh my God, this thing, what I wrote down is going to be published and lots of people are going to read it, hopefully. Yeah. So, so mm. my, the process of writing is really that um, no matter if there's a TV on or people are talking, I can just dive into the thing I write and I notice nothing around myself. And I'm really in that story, in the things I write. And that's that's for me the most relaxing thing ever. Beautiful meditative process. Yeah. Landscape and cafe movement involved. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And the wellness. Perhaps I, I, I may just add that. 80% um, of my book was written um, in a hotel, in a wellness area. And I went there, had uh, perhaps one or two sauna goes, and then I just uh, sat down and wrote. And everyone there already noticed, oh, she's coming. We have to be very silent. She's now writing. Yeah. So I really have the wellness in my book. Yeah, it's a very nice hotel in, in Heidelberg where I live. And yeah. The wellness. And then you mm -hmm. control, control people. You tell people that they must, you know. No, they no, no, no. Know. They say. When the writer comes, they <laughs> right, right. give them a cue. That's right. Smiling. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, Sue, an, an investment analyst. Now, now I'm interested in this writing process, right? And I write about passion. Please just tell us how, what is how is your writing process? So for me, unlike Florence, um, who can immerse herself even in a noisy room or a cafe, yeah. I'm the opposite. So I, I need total silence when I write. Um, no music, nothing, just silence. Um, and I find I thrive in a quiet <laughs> in a quiet space. So I would never be able to do the mug and bean or a Starbucks kind of writing with your laptop. So yeah, for me, silence works, the, you know, the best. Um, and so it, it, that also is a challenge in the sense that, you know, it's not all, it's finding that quiet time during the day is, is very mm. challenging. And especially with me as, you know, I wasn't trained as a writer, um, as you've alluded, I have a, a background in finance and investment. I have a master's in, in finance. And that's what I studied and I had a career spanning over 15 years in that field. But I was always a writer um, from a young, you know, as, as a child, I knew I wanted to write. Um, it's just that, you know, life and your, your parents steer you in a different path. But deep down, I always knew, you know, that this is who I am. I'm a writer. And I, I wrote even when I was young, mm -hmm. when I could find the words, I, you know, before that I would act out stories. So already that inclination was there. And so when I could put words to, to paper, that's what I started doing. And in high school, you know, my books used to be circulated. They were called Sue's books, <laughs> you know, and they were read oh. by my students, my fellow students. So they were the first, like they were my audience, but I would package everything, even though it was handwritten on, on paper, I would make a cover, have a blurb. So I really had a vision of what it, it should look like, you know, and and they read my books and they were always used to feel the encouragement and affirmation. You know, you need to be writing to be writing. So it was quite a surprise when, you know, they met me years later and I wasn't writing. Mm. So, <laughs> but, you know, like, you know, everything happens with time. And, you know, I, I finally found, you know, my way back to it. Even as, a, as I was establishing my career, I still would write. Um, I was a closet writer for many years until I got The Polygamist published in 2012. 
Thank you, Sue. Sue's books. Uh, <laughs> Prof. Pume, what, how does your writing process look like? You please unmute yourself. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, I liked uh, what uh, Florence had to say when she said, my story is everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think this is uh, also a beautiful way of uh, summarizing me because, you know, like I said, uh, when you asked the first question that, uh, you know, I'm very conscious of um, what I have been robbed of as a woman, first as a black person, secondly, as a woman, and perhaps thirdly, as a rural woman, woman with a background from the Bundus. You know, so I always uh, feel that for me, what makes sense and what is, is, is whatever uh, makes the other visible. So the kind of writing that uh, influenced me is that of, you know, like now I'm busy with the, uh, the black archives, promoting the black archives. And what do I mean by that? I mean, those, I mean, I use that metaphorically, perhaps if you've seen anything before on uh, black archives, but for me, what it means is, uh, taking into consideration those works of the great scholars um, who, which have been pushed to the margins and bringing them to the center. And uh, the reason for those works to be sort of forgotten, I say forgotten uh, because, you know, whenever I think of uh, writers such as say Shakespeare, for example, you know, how many languages has uh, that author been translated into? What about us? So, I mean, I, I would even think of male writers, for example, like uh, Benedict Wallet Villagazi, who has been the voice of the voiceless in times of apartheid, and yet whose works are pushed to the margins. And that is due to the historiography of South Africa, whereby the English canon literary texts have been put to, in the center. But then, like I said, there would be just be so many things that I'd like to write about. However, right now, my main focus is rural women and uh, giving them a voice as, it, uh, as, as I related in my recent uh, monograph, first monograph, which is Bashabelelelani, Why Do They Sing? Gender and Power in Contemporary Women's Songs. So, you know, when you go to these women and you live with them and you immerse yourself in them, I feel that I have an advantage of being like them in that I'm also black, Zulu, you know, and it would be in an area where they've been researched so much by, for example, white researchers. So, you know, seeing me amidst them, they just feel that there is hope that something good is going to come out of this research. And I really can say this book, Why Do They Sing, has brought a lot of relief to the women and uh, if you are able to you can actually even join us uh, in the live event on friday uh, the 18th at 12 30 when the book is officially launched and what i like about that is that the kind of voice that i say i've given to women or i feel like i've given to women having been amongst them or in their midst for the past two decades is the kind of performance that they are also going to render just that's authenticizing the journey we have had with them so for me it's just giving that joy and that sense of purpose and that uh, sense that you matter no matter what even if maybe in your households you feel like you are still very much uh, undermined oppressed and that kind of thing but the moment you know when i'm amongst them let them feel a fresh air uh, of breath thank you Thank you, uh, Prof. Mbume. Um, so the, the launch will take place at uh, Pansy Museum, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. That's okay, right. Pansy Museum. Do you want to repeat again? So it's at Pansy Museum. And what's the date? Uh, it's uh, this coming Friday. Um, at and time? 
12, 12 13 18. a day. Yes, so uh, like I'm, I said, I'm talking from Pretoria right now, but tomorrow I'm off to my province of Bears, KZN, for this launch. Um, and thank you so much. What what you what you do so well, you know, description and your feedback is is that uh, is the notion of people being seen, right? And so the Zulu Zulu greeting, which is Saubon, uh, basically means I see you, which then extends to the fact that I see your humanity, and I see you um, with the people who are no longer with you, those who are dead and alive. So Saubon, so you're getting people to be seen, and you're seeing yourself also as from the rural areas, uh, Victoria. Um, now I'm going to go to you. How does your writing process look like? And in describing your writing process, you are allowed to center the book that you're writing also, um, or that you've written. I, yeah, sorry. I just um, I have to apologize. I I'm not sure I can directly address this question. Uh, you see, I've been invited to uh, the Time of the Writer Festival before the full-scale uh, Russian invasion started. And honestly, um, I do remember that I used to write in cafes, but right now those cafes are being destroyed. And um, I think in every writing, and my writing was always about empathy. And I used to travel a lot. Um, uh, the world and, of course, uh, throughout Ukraine. Uh, and I used to write in cafes in many towns and cities and uh, on the trains. Um, but right now, I um, every moment, I do remember that, um, especially in the east of Ukraine, schools are being bombed, apartment blocks are being bombed, maternity hospitals are being bombed. And in the city of Mariupol, we have victims in maternity hospital, like a woman who was going to just give a birth to her baby and uh, she died and her baby died. And we all saw those pictures. And I really feel um, it is inappropriate to, for me to just, you know, remember how I was writing in a cafe or something, um, because right now all my thoughts are not about that. Um, and in order, you know, to to uh, still be myself and maybe someday uh, write again, I have to say what I'm saying now, not not to just talk about writing. I'm sorry for I don't know. I feel like I'm destroying the party, but no. On the, uh, Victoria, thank yes. you for your truth and thank you for your vulnerability. We see you. We are aware of what's going thank on. You. Yeah. Um, and so you're not destroying any party. This is the space, right? Yeah, and, and, yeah, and, 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 it, and it's enough. Do you want to speak? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I just was wanted to refer to the previous speaker that, that yeah, you were talking about being seen and how important is, is that. So thank you very much for seeing me. Thank you. Sorry for, for interrupting. No, it's okay. Don't apologize. Um, your story is enough. Uh, and I will go into the comments right now. Um, because you're being acknowledged. Um, a comment from Ishmael, thank you to Victoria for taking part in the festival under the, the most difficult circumstances in her country. And Noktulam Mazibukom Simang says, strength and prayers, Victoria. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, there is a question uh, from Cindy Swazul. Florence, what has been your challenges as a black German female writer? Have you ever felt any sort of discrimination or looked down upon? If yes, how do you deal with it? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, Living as a black woman here in, in Germany um, is something special because um, of course the people, they see you just as you said, they, yeah, we see Victoria, for example, or just the greeting, I see you, the people see me. And um, when I was small, 
um, as a kid, I lived with my German mom. So I was the foster kid of this German lady. And when I grew up um, and the people noticed that I want to take part in the, in, in the life. So I want to study and I would like to become a teacher. And um, I just want to take normal part of, of the things that white German people do. Then of course, people look at me and think, okay, she's serious. So my book of course is about racism. Um, it's about uh, being a, a woman, being a black woman in this society. And when I started writing the first comment, one person said, when I said, well, I'm going to write my biography. And the person said, well, um, being black, or not being white, that's not an issue anymore in Germany. And it is, it is an issue. But um, this comment should say like, um, well, you know, um, there's no need to talk about that because it's difficult to talk about racism. It's difficult to talk about discrimination, yeah, right. And then of course, there were some people, some male people who said, um, like smirking at me and said, well, you are writing a book, but <laughs> well, you know, what, yeah, like this little, little thing, she, she wants to do a hobby or wants to have a hobby. And um, I was underestimated. Yes, I was, but I'm used to that. And I thought, well, you, you underestimate me, no problem. I will write this book and I will find someone who believes in my book. And even um, when I said, well, before I found my, my publisher, um, then I said, well, is this book going to be published and are people going to read it? And one person said, well, and if you don't publish it, no, no problem. You just write. Yeah. Like let her write. So she is, she is occupied, but uh, no one yeah, will take it seriously. And then when the book was published and when there was this, this uh, nice publisher, um, a lady who said, I believe in you and I believe in your book. Yeah. Then these people, they looked at me and were really astonished. Yeah. But of course, first of all, people don't take you seriously. No, they don't. And how I deal with it? Well, you know, I'm used to it. I'm in my mid 50s. I've been living here for over 50 years. And I'm used to that. I'm used to that, that people say, well, you want to become a headmistress? Oh, well, you, you just keep on doing what you do. Yeah. And when I then um, achieve my goal, then they look at me. Oh, okay. You're serious. You did that. Okay, good. And then it's a problem for them to, to deal with me, right? So I'm used to that. And I always think, you don't take me serious. We will talk again. We will definitely talk again. Oh, we'll talk again. <laughs> and this, what's the title of the book? Damn, she understands me. Yeah, because people think, so this, this really happened in 2020. Um, we were on the road talking to people and they, they spoke to, um, to my partner and then um, I just, and he's white, and I just made a comment. And one of these guys looked at me and said, oh, damn, she understands me because he thought that I couldn't understand German. So when they talk, they can talk about everything because I can't understand. Yeah, but he was wrong. He was mistaken. He was so much mistaken. Yeah. I'll ask you to just read a few, uh, an extract from Damn, She Understands Me. Okay. And you can I will read it in German and will damn well not understand you. <laughs> you can translate to us. <laughs> but I will, I will translate it. That's right. That's right. Um, so how I said, I was raised by a German mom and my parents are Nigerian and they came to Germany in, in order to study. And after a while, so um, when I was nine, they or eight, began when I was eight, they said, we are going back home. And home for me was Germany, was the little town we lived in. But home for my parents, of course, was Nigeria. And now I start... Um, at the part where they came and we, um, yeah, we went to Nigeria. This is the part what I'm going to read. Und dann war es soweit. An einem kalten Februartag packte Mama meine Kleidung in einen Koffer. Aber viel wichtiger war die Tragetasche mit meinen Puppen, der großen und der kleinen braunen Puppe, sowie einem kleinen weißen Teddybär. All das sollte mir den Abschied erleichtern und meine Erinnerungen aufrechterhalten. Mama gab mir ein Geschenk für meine Schwester mit und außerdem einen Puppenjungen, den ich meinem Bruder geben sollte, damit er nicht meine Puppen nahm. 
Mama kannte mich. Sie wollte mir Ärger ersparen. Sie wusste, dass ich es nicht mochte, wenn mein Bruder meine Sachen nahm. Am Abend vor der Ausreise fuhr ich mit Mama und der Nachbarin, die den Weihnachtsmann für mich gespielt hatte, nach Hamburg, um meine Eltern und meine Brüder in einem Hotel zu treffen. Am nächsten Morgen sollte es früh mit der Lufthansa nach Lagos gehen, an einen Ort voller Ungewissheit. Die Nacht war kurz, der nächste Morgen brach an. Wir, war, wir machten uns fertig, um zum Flughafen zu fahren. Ich war gespannt, war ich doch noch nie geflogen. Doch dann erreichte meine Eltern eine Nachricht. Nein, wir würden nicht fliegen. Es gäbe politische Unruhen in Lagos, die Flüge seien vorerst gestrichen. Was für ein Gefühl. Freude und Enttäuschung zugleich. Da war es wieder, das Unangekündigte, das Spontane, das Willkürliche. Nur dieses Mal konnten meine Eltern nichts dafür, zumindest nicht direkt. Indirekt schon. Wie ich fand. So this was the part um, when my mom, my German mom, um, put all my things in my suitcase and uh, we went to Hamburg. Hamburg is, is the place where the airport is, where we, want, where we met my parents and my brothers. And for me, it was very important to have, sure, my clothes and everything, but my dolls. I, I loved dolls and I had one big white doll and a very small black doll. And that doll was named after my sister. And my sister waited for us in Nigeria. She was in Nigeria. My parents didn't bring her uh, to Germany. So um, my mom and um, a neighbor, a lady, uh, we went and myself, we went to Hamburg and met my parents there and my brothers. Uh, one was quite, was four, five. One was five and one was a baby, five weeks old. And then uh, we stayed there overnight in a hotel. And in the morning, uh, we wanted to go to the airport. And then my parents were called and was said, no, the planes, they can't um, um, take, uh, take off. And we can't travel to Nigeria because in Nigeria, there were political um, riots. And that's why uh, no plane is going to Nigeria. So um, for me, it was very hard, the imagination, leaving my mom and going to Nigeria. And in that moment, it was said, okay, you can go. Um, home with your mom, so home to my German home, yeah, but there will be one day when we come and pick you up, and then we will go to Nigeria, so for me, it was something like um, flying and not knowing when the hard drop is going to come, yeah, because I didn't want to go to Nigeria, I wanted to stay with my mom. Mm. Thank you for that um, encounter of negotiating home and what home looks like, in between spaces and in between countries. Sue, um, I know you've got your hand up and so please talk, but also in you talking, please highlight the writing project that you are engaging in um, right now for us. Okay, um, thanks for that. So as, as Florence was talking, um, she reminded me of a book I had read recently called Coconut. Mm. by Florence Olegide. I don't know if you've read it, Florence, because your, your stories are very similar. In this book, Florence is also born to Nigerian parents in, in the UK, in London. Mm. And they, her parents were also studying. And because of, of that, they also had a, a nan for her. You know, you'd be fostered by British, you know, a, a family um, whilst your parents went to, went to school. And she had the same experience that when, you know, when they decided they wanted to go back home. To Nigeria, uh, it was the same kind of you know discussion like you probably had. But she she did go back to Nigeria, mm -hmm. and so it's for me it's an interesting story about you know identity politics and you know negotiating your two sort of homes. And I think it would actually because I think the book came out as it last year. I think it would be interesting to your books. I think would make <laughs> and and you and Florence are both in education, so your stories are very alike in the sense that when she came back to the UK. And how she tried to negotiate, you know, being a British but Black uh, Nigerian. And so I, I think your stories are very, very similar. And she's also in education. I think you have a lot in common. So maybe you should look, look out for each other <laughs> and connect. Yeah. And we have the same name, actually. Yes. <laughs> so there's quite a lot <laughs> you could unpack there. Um, Thank you for that, yeah. for sharing. So can you please just... Um, highlight uh, the writing project because you've written a lot of books 
highlight one book that you want to actually engage us on and um, the synopsis of the book. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll speak about A Family Affair because that, that book is in a sense, it wasn't, it was published in 2020, but it, it probably took me, it wasn't, I started writing it when I was 20. So it's like, it's been work in progress for like 20 years. Um, and, you know, the thing is with that book, it's, it's about women growing up in a patriarchal society because I grew up, you know, I was spoons fed on patriarchy, as I say. And it, it's only when you, you're older, when you start to like, you know, question, like, you know, why do we do these things? Um, and you start, you know, challenging patriarchy um, and the way it oppresses you. Mm. So for me, that, that book is, you know, just showed my journey, you know, um, as I started to question around me, you know, uh, patriarchy and the social constructs and the societies we grow up in. And not only do you have patriarchy to contend with, you also have a culture that is very patriarchal and religion, you know, um, in the country where I come from, religion is also another layer that reinforces, you know, the, the patriarchal constructs. So A Family Affair is really about a story of three sisters who are raised in this middle-class home and the dad becomes a pastor in a church and how that dynamic also affects them and, and the choices that they make, um, you know, in their lives and, the, and the, the consequences. And, you know, one of the themes in that book is gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. but it, it's a, it's, it tells the story of, of women who don't necessarily survive, survive to tell their own stories. And mm -hmm. I think that was what led to the anthology that I then subsequently edited of nonfiction narratives because then it was of women who have actually survived. Um, because I, I feel like there is no one single story about survival mm -hmm. and what it looks like. And mm -hmm. when I wrote my novel, A Family Affair, I didn't want to paint a certain picture and feed into certain narratives about what survival looks like for, for women um, having su survived gender-based violence. And so for me, you know, I, like when I write, I always, you know, it's, I always have like my, I know what I want to say. So in the, before I start any book, I know what my, my aim is. And then I always decide like, so who's going to tell that story, you know, and then I pick, my characters, I'll be like, okay, she's going to tell this, you know, this is like, and that's how it starts, you know, for me. So I always know what I want, you know, ultimately what I want to say with each book, but, you know, then I, then I start picking the characters and then, yeah, I start, you know, thinking of how do we, you know, how, how are we going to tell who's going to be the, the vehicle? So my characters are like sort of the, the, the vehicles in telling the story. And then I just, and then I start and I start writing it and, but with the family affair, because, it was also a novel in terms of growing an awareness. The, the storylines, you know, grew also because I, it's a book I started in my 20s. I left, revisited in my 30s. And I left and revisited again in my 40s because I'd also grown as a woman through that period. And the way I saw things in my 20s was different in the, same, in the way the perception changed and my position, positionality also changed in terms of the way I viewed certain issues around womanhood mm -hmm. and so for me really in writing um, as mom Zondi says Zondi says as well it's it's to give voices to women you know black women like me because when I grew up I never saw books you know about us you know authentic stories about us and so that became my my own you know way of you know putting those stories out there and yeah so a lot, you know, it's it's a it's a experiences which you know it's important and that we narrate them. And like Victoria is saying that you know, as you spoke about the pain and the anguish that you're going through this during this mm -hmm. trying time, um, I, I feel your pain, and I can imagine what it's like for for a lot of women, you know, um, during this time. And sometimes it could actually be very cathartic to put those thoughts down, you know, and put that pain onto paper. You know, because a lot of us, we don't get to hear the intimate side, you know, of, you know, seeing your favorite cafe being bombed. What we see is just news footage being bombed and thrown at us, but it, we don't get the heart of what's really going on. You know, the, 
how people are affected every day. Like if your woman goes to give birth and her life is lost. Those are what we, we, we the humanity, that's the loss of the humanity that mm. is, you, you're telling us about, which we don't see on television. And that's, that's how, you know, the, the violence of war is, tends to be like sort of, you know, distance from, you know, people and, and the, from, from our feelings. So thank you so much for your courage to come onto the platform. We appreciate you and we see you. Uh, thank you so much. What, what, you, what you do so well um, is, I'm gonna go to Chimamande, we all should be feminists. But what I'm gonna go into is the danger of a single story. You know that YouTube clip when she talks about the danger of a single story and how even women's stories are, uh, have many <laughs> tentacles, right? So to the point that the family affair leads to an anthology. Victoria, I know you've got your hand up, but I also would like you to speak to the point that you were gonna make about your hand up, but also speak to the Brooke project that you want to present to us and what it means to, uh, to you. And you can provide us with a synopsis also. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And first of all, I want to thank you, Sue, and, and Florence. And I want to say that, you know, uh, right now I feel so warm and I don't feel alone uh, anymore. So thank you so much for having me here and for, for talking so sincerely. Um, and now, you know, I can remember that all those issues that you mentioned, Flores and Sue and everyone, uh, they were, I, I was interested in them before. For instance, uh, of course, I'm a feminist and uh, there was this theme that triggered me and uh, uh, has driven me in my writing. And uh, of course, I don't have um, much to say about that, but um, I was a huge supporter of Black Lives Matter. I was in Boston at, at the time. and. Uh, um, I'm trying, I understand that I cannot say here, but, um, but uh, I really understand that all of those things are important. And I was listening to Florence uh, about her book, uh, Damn, She Understands Me, and it sounds so wonderful. And uh, I wish that uh, when the uh, Ukrainian publishing industry is uh, uh, back on, we can uh, translate all of your books from, from English, from, from German, and uh, have them published here. I think this is what we should do. Uh, as for my book project, uh, um, I actually was writing about the war because uh, the, war, the war conflict here started in uh, 2014 when Russia invaded the east part of Ukraine. It just was a small conflict compared if we compare it to what we have now. So my um, project was uh, about war and I just I would just read an excerpt for you, but I'm not sure if we have time for that. Please go on. If we if we just go on, um, yeah, just a small extract. Um, yeah, so it's uh, the beginning of uh, my novel about uh, a sister looking for her sister. Mm. I simply wanted to tell you about the light, how I miss those patterns that the sun once painted on the kitchen floor when we were kids. Indeed, that's all I was going to tell you, Lily. But then I just couldn't stop. I kept talking until I told the whole story, everything you have missed. I kept whispering like a radio station that people only listen to by accident. I am like this lonely radio station now. People overhear my murmurs and give me looks. Those looks which grandpa eventually got used to, but I kept noticing for him. Grandpa would be proud of me now. I too don't care what others think of me anymore. Wherever I go, I have to describe everything to you. I've been talking to you ever since you vanished, and I wandered the streets, examining patterns of light on the cracked asphalt as if they could bring you back. I kept uttering your name when looking into abandoned houses' windows, startled by my reflection that looked like yours. I felt you near me when asking the stray dogs, like a child, have you seen my sister? A young woman like me, only prettier, with much, much longer hair and a motorcycle helmet under her arm. I didn't dare to ask people, not even once. The dogs just ran away as if they could smell disloyalty. The trade betrayed animals should despise the most. I imagine what you think of me, and you're right. Your sister turned out to be a coward. 
I had let you down and then wasn't really trying to save you. Moreover, I stopped your mother from searching. It wasn't difficult as she was so weak, unprepared and invariably drunk after you had disappeared. She would get herself into trouble just like you did. She's still pretty despite all the vodka, as brave as ever. If I had let her, she would have done the most reckless things in an attempt to save you, but would it help? Your mother has brought me up, but I'm not your kind. I'm different, Lily. I'm cautious, I'm overthinking, I'm indecisive. I cannot drive motorbike like you do or did. This inability is the very reason why after you got your shiny Harley from Mr. God knows who, I worked my ass off to buy the old Ford and dared to drive the car at least. I went to the bar you had worked in after dropping out of university. The waitresses, friends of yours, and the men, your admirers, all wearing black despite the hot weather, and those new aliens wearing camouflage jackets and guns looked at me as if they all knew what happened. I froze for a moment. I came there to ask if anyone could please help me find you. But amidst the unusual silence, I only asked, do I look like a ghost? Then I ran away, not waiting for them to answer. I'm so, sorry, Lily, I was never looking for you, but for a sign that the city would bring you back, like the surf should bring back lost toys to a child, scared to go into the sea. There was no sign, just the sound of distant shelling and howling, just the rumors that girls and women who have disappeared in the occupied city of Donetsk would better be dead. Are you dead? Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I love the apology of, I'm sorry, um, you know, um, I'm just the ghost, that line also. Just when we search for our humanity through a time of war, right? And the invis invisibility of our humanity. And, and how do you speak to children? What memories do you give to children around that time? Um, and, and stories, are a way in for children. They are a tool for knowledge creation. What is the title of, of the book, Victoria? Uh, well, it is meant to be the road to Ukraine uh, because actually it is about how we talk to children because eventually uh, the main character starts telling uh, a story to her younger sister about the country they came from. And mm -hmm. it's not real Ukraine, but rather Ukraine is an imaginary perfect country where there's no, uh, you know, no no invasion, no no war, and so life is perfect. Not not like our history. Mm, mm. But I mean, what starts to come up um, is this notion, this negotiation of home, right? And what you remind me of is Wasa Shan's um, Shaya's poem that no one leaves home just for the sake of leaving home. Um, uh, you leave home because it's become, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, because it's become a mouth of a shark. Yeah. Ooh. Right now, actually, my son and my niece are evacuated to Poland. So even my dog is evacuated to Poland. So I'm here alone and I'm staying here to volunteer and help. So. We are with you, Victoria, and thank you for your vulnerability. And thank you for taking time out to actually share your story. And I think stories live on and, and, and to think about children and how you're gonna transmit that knowledge, creation and disrupt the violence. That's an ongoing, um, um, what? Ongoing resistance to tell stories? Yeah. And, yeah. and thank you so much. And I wanna apologize again because I made it, you know, again, you're a Victoria, woman shouldn't yes. apologize. Yes. Women should not apologize. I'm gonna actually, cut you off and I was told I mustn't you. cut you off. We, are no, we should not apologize for being vulnerable, for speaking our truth in a time when there's violence to women, when there's violence and our children are growing through a war. Don't apologize for feeling you are enough. Sagborna, in Guazulu Natal say we see you. Sagborna, we hear. Sue? I had a question for Victoria in terms of 
censorship. I mean, when you say you wrote about Ukraine, was that to was it because of censorship, or you just wanted to imagine just a different sort of reality in your book? No, we we never. I mean, during the independence times, we never had censorship in Ukraine. Um, where they had a, maybe sometimes a lack of order, but never we had censorship. We are very free, and this is what we fight for now to preserve our freedom. So yeah, this is just an imaginary country, and it is um, more to reimagine that uh, was. I started this project in 2020, so it was more to reimagine the century, uh, the 20th century history of Ukraine. Uh, because, uh, as you probably know, uh, Ukraine was in the middle of both World War I and World War II. And it was occupied both by Nazi and then by the Soviet Union. So it's really what uh, uh, historian Timothy Snyder calls bloodlands. Uh, and that is why all those uh, traumatic experiences, of course, influenced generations of people here. And uh, this is why I was trying to uh, imagine how we could raise our children uh, without, without that traumatic memory that influenced them. But right now I will have to change our pro my project apparently uh, because new events uh, happened and this will influence my project as well. Thank you so much for your support and for your question. Thank you, Sue and Victoria. I mean, I'll read one comment uh, before we end this chat. As Amam Kiza said, writing and talking about race is difficult for who? Responding to Florence's um, uh, statement, uncomfortable for who? Being black and living the black experience in our, is our lives. So when we point out the racism, makes them uncomfortable. So shift the story. Um, we've come to, to the end of our session. Thank you so much um, for your inputs and your discussions and, and your stories. And thank you for sharing and your vulnerabilities. Um, what comes through very well in your writing is the stories of women, how story is, and making a story and telling stories and, and writing stories that you all have done is imagining the possibilities of of, of the violence, beyond the violence of race and gender and power. Thank you. Siabong.